you're on my computer, being recorded. Welcome everyone. My name is Richard Gordon Kelly and welcome to our Leadership Insight group with my colleagues and good friends, Bart Luz and Harriet Anderson. We also have our guest speaker, Billy Mann from Ireland and Joe Fletcher who's joined us into this discussion as well. So uh, looking forward to that. As you know, um, we're all coaches in some way and we support businesses and uh, organizations across the board. And so we invited Billy Mann on because of his experience. And I'm going to let him talk a little bit more about that. But we came up with the title of Coach and Leadership, and we found that very interesting from Billy's point of view. So what I'm going to allow is Billy to just give a little bit of a rundown about himself and then on the topic of culture and leadership. So enjoy, and we'll speak to you all later. Billy, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have got the invite to, to join you all today. Um, my history in business is all my life. If I give you a quick rundown of, I've grown up in family businesses and small business all of my life. My parents were in business, all my siblings are in business, I was in business forever, I still am. It's a coaching business now, but I think uh, I opened my own salon in 1992. Um, I was a hairdresser in a previous life. And so I ran that business until last year, until the, the arrival of COVID. And um, we'll say there was a bunch that year early on where I had initial success because just rampant enthusiasm got me got me, you know, to a certain stage. And then I ran into other kinds of problems and cyclical issues around stress and worry and, and my own issues getting in the way of whatever, running the business. And so around 2007, 2008, really just at the beginning of the downturn, I started to the last downturn, we'll say, I had just begun to look at the at business and I suppose it had become a matter of survival to survive, you know, the financial downturn of 2008, because as anybody that's here is old enough remembers that everything stopped. Credit stopped. Literally everything just stopped instantaneously. And so it became about survival. Like one of my friends said, survival is the new boom. Keeping your door open is the way to go now. And so that began my journey then into how am I going to maximize this? How am I... And I found that all my efforts, what I had done inadvertently is I had built a business around me. So I was the primary earner of money in the business. I was driving the business. I was doing all the work. And rather than having a productive staff, they were more serving my needs. And so I had bottlenecked myself. So I couldn't grow, I couldn't make the business, I couldn't function, uh, the, the, like the worry, you know, the, the overdraft, the, the, the real tightening of credit for running the business, I needed more cash, you know, all of these problems surfaced. And what they did also surfaced was my inadequacy around leadership and my inadequacy around running a business and stuff, and actually managing staff. And the guy that I did that, that I hired, his name is Simon Lattinger, um, a coach specifically to the hairdressing industry. And even though despite coming away from the hairdressing deliberately and, and, and coaching as a business, he's still my coach. Even despite all the other coaches that I have, I, I have hired down through the years, he's always been the one coach that, that I've hired. So I've had a 14, 15, almost 15 year relationship with this guy. And so it's a very close relationship, still a professional relationship, coaching, uh, kind, but it's deeper than that now. And so that began that, that began the dismantling of it and, 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 and the rebuilding of the business from the, from the ground up again. And so what other businesses were going under in 2009, 2010, we were starting to, to thrive and starting to build upwards against the tide of the time. Prevailing logic was the recession and stuff. And so that's what, and, and that's what started to take root inside in the business. Um, and it, it just, it, it, the team started to naturally evolve in themselves around it. And that, of course, 
but my own work then really began so I began to realize and I think that this may come as a bit of a shock to people that may be listening to us that usually in small businesses the employer is actually the problem not necessarily the solution I was the problem because it was my business it was my staff it was and, and so I had that mindset that mentality of it just being about me inside in the business and because of that, then I was blocking any kind of staff innovation. I was blocking any chance of growing a business. And around that, then we began systems and processes around it. And after that kind of period of time and the salon was turning around, I was also involved in external training for hairdressing. I would go to salons. I had a reputation as a trainer for staff, etc. And this started to creep into conversations with the staff and it started to creep into conversations with the um, with the salon owners. And so over a period of a couple of years, then I kind of began a, an ad hoc uh, consultancy for other salon owners or staff. So I'd often be brought in to deal with kind of staff issues and stuff like that and the breakdown of communication between maybe sometimes the, the employer and the staff or simply just to go in with the staff, maybe working on their hairdressing skills, but ultimately sort of typically kind of working my way through there are problems. That's what the employer would ask me to do as well as just, you know, get a feel for where things are and can I solve their problems uh, connection wise between themselves, etc. So that's basically how I developed all of this. And down to the years, then um, I, I maintained that along with running my business and along with coaching as well. So there's a busy time for a while, you know. So that's what kind of brought me into this area, if to give you in its most condensed. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Billy, for sharing that. Mm. Uh, you always have a wonderful way of sharing your words and, <laughs> and the history and the, the past experiences you've had. Mm. The question relating to the title now, cultural leadership, uh, did you see a big change in the culture in yourself and in the leadership that you created, that you well, had created? Began, and, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, 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 it always begins with the employer. It always begins with the person at the top, whoever the main stakeholder is, the decision ultimately. Now, I, I, I don't, I've never worked in the corporate environment, but I've worked in small business environment. But whether you're leading a team of two or 10 or 15, you're still at the front of it. The decisions are yours um, ultimately. But what I found was the more I empowered them, the more I got into the conversation with them, the more that I opened up all of that, the, the dynamic shifted, the culture had to shift because it went from being, I, I use the word loosely, dictatorial, like me having the final say in everything to being a strong collaborative process. And they had a buy-in then. And you know, hairdressing is, is a peculiar industry in the sense that you know, you often hear it in coaching as well. Coaching is one thing, running the business is another. Hairdressing is one thing, running the business is another. Because hairdressing is quite a creative um, field for obvious reasons. But it also led to a lot of egos. You know, artists and people, you know, would have the prima donna ego around their value and their worth, etc. So you, a lot of time you have to kind of navigate around that stuff as well. And so it, it teaches you to be... It teaches you how to be agile around egos, you know, but um, the, the, the cultural shift, one of the main cultural shifts I found was that people who see the vision, who, who, who get where you're coming from, will stay with it. And the ones that don't invariably just will self-exclude themselves, you know, they'll just, they'll eventually just drift off into somewhere else because it just won't suit them, the culture won't suit them. So, you know, by default, the group will clean itself up as well. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, Billy. I'd like to bring anyone else in. Joe, Harriet Bart, if you've got any questions uh, relating to what Billy just shared there, it would be interesting to uh, see what you think uh, regarding the culture and also the leadership aspect of running a small business. Uh, I see that uh, in my side also that, that running a small business is um, we think it can be complex, but we create that complexity. 
and we create also the the fact that uh, we're invincible but actually no it's it's the people and the team around us that help us to succeed into what who we can what it can be who it can be and who we can be in that situation i i, I you know leverage became a word i hadn't understood that you know i discovered that leverage was a word that i that i didn't know what it meant was to leverage your staff you know um i think if I maybe to, just to maybe share the, what began this process, I, I can remember having these conversations with Simon, and you recognize this as well in both what we now refer to as personal and impersonal, you know. But I suppose when I started this, it, was, it, it had to cause a lot of self reflection, you know. Was I, where was I going wrong? What, what was it that I was doing or not doing or whatever? So it, it, it can be kind of a painful process. So over a period of time, myself and Simon had, had, had figured it out into the sense of whatever we do, it, we had to make sure the staff knew a division of what the plan was to make this bigger, brighter, faster, more lucrative for everybody. And um, so the very first kind of conversations I had were around this, this describing the difference between a professional conversation and a personal conversation. Because often when we have to have a conversation with an employee or, you know, or as an issue has, has arisen, including ourselves, sometimes we take it personally as a reflection of who we are in the world, where our place in the world is, you know. Um, so if, I, if there was an issue on the floor, that would never be dealt on the floor. This would be in the back in the office or in the kitchen and we talk about it and we talk it out. Mm. But being in a torsely prickly business, people made it about themselves as if a reflection of who they were as human beings in the world. So the, I, around the very start of this, the conversation started to say, this is not a reflection of who you are. You know, this doesn't change how I feel about you. This doesn't change about how you should feel about yourself. This is just simply a gap in the information. This is where something went wrong. Let's figure out where it went wrong. Where's the gap in your understanding? Let's fill that gap and move on. Whereas before what would happen was I would we'd come in and we'd sit down aside in the kitchen and I would a, either be afraid to broach the subject or, or B, come at it ham-fisted so the other person would take it as a person, you know, and a row would ensue, hurt feelings would ensue, and suddenly everything ground to a halt. You were two days trying to calm somebody down then. And so I found that, you know, once, we be, once people that I started to work with began to understand this, we're not talking about you as a human being. We're talking about there's a gap somewhere. Let's fix it and fill the gap. And that was that. That really w was uh, a seminal moment in the business because now it pre-framed everything else and it now allowed us to sit down and start having conversations. And it it it, it, it that was perhaps the most uh, palpable change because trust came in then really came in because people knew then what they were talking about that it wasn't a personal thing that there's something not working here there's something not working here and we began that process then of working through what is and what isn't working and and, and like you say the culture in an environment of trust and openness the culture will all these things change by themselves because the feeling of it changes and when I began this process, I spoke to them about, you know, that this is where they came to earn their livelihood, but it's also where I came to earn my livelihood. We were all earning out of this business. Every one of us were taking our living from this business. So, it, you know, for all of us to benefit more from it, it was in our benefit to make sure that it ran well, to suit ourselves. So we, we basically looked at our needs and we looked at what everybody wanted out of the business and finances and time and holidays and we discussed everything. And we basically built the business around our, need, our own personal needs as well. And so everybody, for the most part, everybody got what they were looking for. We, I rarely ever had to deal with a sick day issue. Stuff like that just didn't, didn't arise. It just didn't seem to be needed. You know, people didn't need a day off, if you know what I'm trying to say to you, just need a day off. We were able to plan all of these things out well in advance. And it began with those conversations. Yeah, and, and it helps, doesn't it? When it's when there's that ease and that 
as you said, the trust, trust mm. within yourself, knowing what to say and knowing what's been said, except and what to say at that moment. Mm. But also the 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 compassion, the love, the understanding that you have for that other human being who's in front mm. of you, who's working with you nearly seven, eight hours a day. <laughs> I, mean, I used to say that, you know, that I, I, I that I, this was my own personal thing that if I'm going to spend as much time or, or, or more with these people that I am with my own family, I may as well find people I love to work with. And so I surrounded myself with people I love being with. And that made it a lot easier as well, you know. Um, and, and we built a process in around employing somebody. You know, we even sat down to discuss that and we agreed that what I would do is that I would interview everybody that we were looking for a job. I would then give them a two day trial. And if the staff said, OK, we'd give them a three month trial. But I didn't pick the employee. Like I said, anybody can work for me, but whoever you pick must work with you. So pick the person that you feel that will best fit your needs. And in our industry, like in, like in any job, most people can only hold their shape for about five or six weeks, you know, before the, the, you know, the bad habits might start creaking in or, you know, the little nuances that people have managed to hold down but start to creep in after about five or six weeks in a smaller business. So you get to see that. So that was, that's where that three-month trial came from. Because by the third month, you, were, you, you got to see the person underneath. And either they, either they made it through the process or not, but the staff picked the employee. And so they were taking responsibility for the people that worked inside. And it wasn't just me that was taking responsibility. They were now taking responsibility for who worked in the business with them. So they were making, they were making sure that they were picking somebody who was at their standard. Yeah, they're taking responsibility for themselves as well. And, and, and in that respect of you're giving them that autonomy, you're giving them that understanding that, you know, it's not only it's your business had the name over the over the roof, over the sign, mm. but you know, they are part of your family, your your neighborhood, your network of people mm -hmm. that you work with. Huh? And, mm. and and allowing them to also to serve themselves and to serve others in a way that makes a big difference. It means that they come in smiling on with their face, yeah. wanting to be in the business. And that creates a big difference in a culture. And it makes a big difference for the leader. Well, you, 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 I, I think, Richard, truth be known, happy staff are productive staff. And, you know, it's not always about more money and more holidays because you can throw more money and more holidays at a situation but if somebody's fundamentally unhappy with where they're working you're not going to keep them they just won't and they won't be productive either they'll do a certain amount but if their heart isn't in the place you know you're only really only ever going to get 50 to 60 maybe 70 percent of that person you're not going to get the 100 percent productivity which is what you're paying for as well i might add you're paying for that time. You're paying for that productivity. You you know. So if they're only giving you uh, seventy percent of the value, you know, for for doing that. So I, it was one of the reasons why I I surrounded myself with people that I could connect with, people that I had a good relationship with. They they each had a good relationship with each other. That and, and that's how it worked. There was that. There was a community uh, spirit inside in the staff room every week when we literally sat down. We we carved out a time every every Thursday morning where everybody was together. And that was that that half hour was sacrosanct. The phone wasn't answered in the salon, nothing was done, and we would sit down for a half an hour and we would discuss everything. So if there was no and we discussed everything during the week, back and forth anyway, but there was always a given period of time every week, half hour, 45 minutes, where we literally just discussed everything that needed to be discussed openly and out in the and on the floor. So we had no rows and stuff. That energy never kind of came into the business. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. Harriet, Bob, Joe? Yeah. Can I ask you yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> go ahead, Bart. Go ahead. Um, I have a question, Billy. Um, working with um, quite a bunch of uh, business owners, 
one thing that most always shows up is um, th that they have a hard time letting go of control. Is there something that helped you uh, in that process of uh, shifting from that dictatorial kind of leadership to a more uh, open letting go of things, not, not taking things, uh, hmm. trying to, to, to be micromanaging and stuff like that. If that makes sense to you. Yeah, it makes perfect sense, yeah. Mark. Um, I, I had alluded to it earlier on when, um, I, like I said, I had found myself in the bottleneck. And what happened was that I was carrying the business. I was literally carrying the business because that was, it was built around my name. It was built around my reputation and it was all about me. So basically what I had was I had built my own cross. And so when things started to go, we'll say south in 2007, 2008, um, I, I, I had to see like, how am I going to expand? I, I, I either, find a way of making more money or I start letting staff go and letting staff go was the last decision that I wanted to make was the absolute last decision that I wanted to make and any employer never wants to let go of staff or have to sanction staff or fire them or whatever it's the last thing that me personally as an employer that I would have ever liked to have done and we we, we, we started looking at cutting our seal and it started to get quite messy and then, like I said, when I started to work with Simon and I began to realize that, well, wait a second, there is actually a an easier way to do this, um, which was simply just sitting down to talk with the staff. And B, because I did that, you know, like I say, about the more the conversation I had with him, the more I could uh, see where I was getting in the way, the more where I was, it's about me and... I can't trust you to do the job as good as me type stuff. It was shallow and it was egotistical looking back on it now. But back then it was a huge issue. You know, I, I mean, I, it's all about me. And that was the problem. And so with the conversation starting and kind of starting to let go a little bit, and I suppose we were all testing each other for a little while, the release became na more natural once we started to. Um, I know they're small things, but they make a huge difference to the quality of somebody's working experience. We never had a receptionist in the business. I always felt it was an expense that, were, that, that I, I, I didn't need to have in the business. So how do we answer the phone on a busy day was a question. And so we literally role played answering the phone. And usually when it worked most of the time, you know, sometimes obviously didn't, we were things when they got a bit heavier inside in the salon. But the phone would ring and I'd answer it. And I could be the nearest reception desk and they'd answer it again, then I'd answer it again. So how do we solve that problem? We bought ourselves a hands-free phone for the salon. I'd answer the phone, take the appointment, and when i come back to my section, I'd hand the phone to the next person, hand the phone to the next person, hand the, and so the phone would pass around so nobody inside in the salon was answering the phone all the time. And there were little things like that. So I never had to have a conversation about being the boss around being answering the phone or phone technique. They had decided this was the best way to operate it. So everybody got, it, it was fair for everybody. And we all had an idea of how we answered the phone. We all answered the phone. the straight. And those little things for me back started, well, oh, well, there you go. So if we do that with the phone, if we did that with like, you know, cleaning the salon, if we did that with when the mirrors are supposed to be cleaned, if we did that about toilet maintenance, if we did that about keeping the kitchen clean, if we did that about working with the clients. And the more we kind of built these little systems in that the staff built now in my head, I asked the question and left them after, you know, where, what's working with the reception desk? I know what's not working with the reception desk and work backwards from that. And they made all these decisions because it was about their working environment. And the, the more I gave it, I gave it over to them, you know, the freer I became. And I, got, I, I just started getting used to being able to take more time off. Um, I saw the staff getting far more productive because they were earning more. And they, they felt that their opinions and, and, and their contributions were valued. 
and, and, and it just it, it just started naturally, Bart. It started to, to to just the more I got used to the idea, and the more I could trust you know, which is a thing that I could trust them to do that. Then the process itself took over then as well. And so even if I wasn't there for three weeks, I could come back and everything was still running away as it normally did. Everything was accounted for, all the money was accounted for, all the stock was accounted for. We had a system around ordering stock. We knew exactly what our minimum, you, you know, all of these little things. So if somebody, anybody could do the stock order inside in the salon because we had a list. We knew exactly what the minimum numbers were or the maximum numbers were on certain. We used lots of one or little of another. So anybody looked at the sheet, I was a tick, 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 tick. The rep would come in, we'd give him the order, he was gone. And I didn't have to do any of that stuff anymore. The staff did it. The staff did all the ordering for the for the salad. You know, it's something simple as stock kicking wasn't I didn't even have to do it. It was being done for me. So little by little back, once I started to I started to feel the benefits of it. It became a much easier process then. Does that answer your question, Bart? I hope. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, it's it's sometimes stunning to see in in, in um, small businesses that uh, they don't have those simple small processes down, so that every employee actually knows what to do in a certain um, uh, context. So and it, it, it's it, it's. <laughs> it, it's it's funny that it's so those simple things mm -hmm. that are so obvious that are when when you have like a a business owner who started their own business and and uh, grew along the years and then uh, br brought in more people they kept doing things in their own way but they, they often don't think about the process and teaching their people mm. in how we could do things and what i heard you say is that you and your team figure things out together which is another distinction as a business owner you can say we should do this 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 and this that way but it's in my experience much more uh, powerful if you can do that with the team uh, as you mm. as you sh as you have shown and that uh, the the resources in the team the resources in the people but I, I see it at the moment a client of mine in south africa um runs a, runs a small business in south africa with a number of employees and she was referred to me because she had reached young woman uh, reached some just born out she was completely toasted from, from all the work and all the going and it was affecting all parts of her life. And so when we started out early on the conversation, it was mostly around her emotional state and the stresses and the strains and, you know, and, and drawing all that to the surface just to, just to get it out, you know. And so we, did, we, we worked around that for a while, around her own psychology and beliefs, etc. And we just started rolling into the business. And I just asked, you know, what would you like to see out of the business? What is, you know, in the future, where are you at, et cetera? And typical coaching questions. And at this stage, she was working um, seven days a week, seven long days because she had, her, she had a business and then she had her own work to do, her own personal work to do, as it were. And he was, he was having a strain in her relationship and all of this, and she couldn't plan anything. So I just started having a conversation with her. She was after taking on a new employee and I asked her a few questions about this new employee and what, what was going on. And that stimulated this whole conversation with her. Now, she has nothing to do with hairdressing at all. She's an entirely different. She's in the construction industry. But the principles remain the same, Bart. They just remain the same regardless. And regardless of the size of the business that you're in, you know, because even corporates are running teams. You know, so the, the team psychology is so incredibly important. And so we started to discuss this and we started discussing her business and, you know, how could she, you know, what could she relinquish here and what could she, you know, t tolerating and testing all of this stuff. And 
she ran the business a particular way. She was very clear about how she ran the account. She was very clear about how she ran everything. And she, she brought on this girl. And I think, lucky for all of us, I happened to be on the scene when she brought on this woman. Because at the start, she wasn't doing it the way she was supposed to do it. And she couldn't teach her how to do it. And you know, it was going back and forth. And I said, but have you asked her? If she had a way to, that, that would give you the same result, but she had a more efficient way, etc., of doing it or whatever, or just think, and she said, I haven't. So I said, back she went. And that happened two months ago back. Um, a couple of weeks ago, she, came, she we were on our call and she said to me, she said, I, I have a confession, she said, and, and, and a success to, for you. And I said, go on. She said, I have a seven year, I call it my shame project. I'm seven years looking at this project in the corner that I wanted to do for the business. I know the pure shame. And she said, every week I'd, I, I, I'm going to do it this week. And she said, seven years later, it was still sitting there. But her new bookkeeper came in two months after, two and a half months after starting working there uh, into her office. She sat down in front of her with a jotter pad and a pin. And she got her to speak about this shame project that was, that was boxed off and up in the shelves inside in the office. And she... The lady took it all and she broke, she said she took all her notes, she broke it all down, exactly what I wanted from it. I come back a week later and the whole project is finished. I had one half an hour with her sitting inside in the office. And she, I said to her, I said, what changed for her? I said, that's fantastic. She was thrilled now. This is seven years looking at this. And I said, what changed? And she said, this is what the, uh, Pam said to her. She said, I feel I'm working in a company where my contribution is valued. And the moment, they, and, and, and in that moment, uh, my client just recognized the value of that because she recognized, well, wait a second, if I can do that here, where else does it work? She's now down to five days a week back. She's now down to working an average of nine, maybe 10 hours from, a, from an average seven day, 12 hour week. She's beginning to see the value of these kind of conversations and she's now recognizing like the immense talent that she, that, uh, that's in her employees. The girl that's in the sales department is, is flowering because of it, because she's now doing the same work. The guys that are out doing her, that are delivering her services on the ground. She's now starting to have conversations with the van men and, and, and her fitters and all that stuff. And so all that's working through and she's now actively looking at how can I take the business for, to 7 to 1, maybe 2 p.m. every day and be home in time? I can actually start the family. You know, so you go from, like, you can literally go from, like, being seven days a week to having what it is that suits you with just a simple little bit of direction and a simple bit of, of open communication and trusting the people that are around you and giving yourself a chance to see the talents that they can bring to the table it's no good having the most talented people in the world if you're not going to let them use their talents and so she and she's be really begun to see the value of that to the point that I, 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 which i had to kind of almost rein her in, in our last conversation that she's plans for another business now active mind but i wanted to kind of get this cultural change embedded in her business before she <laughs> decides to take off and do something else just for now you know it's just all the time to do it but it, it, it's it's got nothing to do with my pre previous industry at all it's a completely different uh, industry it's a construction industry but yet somehow the principles remain the same communication with your staff open it up and the more she's doing it, the, the freer she's feeling and, the, and, and she's trusting them more because she's trusting herself more. And the stress levels have gone down, she's as happy and, she, you know, so I, I, that's the external example of it. Harriet, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, well, no, but this is all the joy of, of coaching when you, you see that the clients are making these steps and making this progress. Yes. But, but it really starts with her trusting herself yeah. uh, that, she, that she actually chose people who have qualities and that she can rely on. Um, and, but this whole thing of trust, trusting yourself and then allowing people to decide with you and giving away control, that's also, it's all trust. And mm -hmm. it's not really something that I think generally we are taught in our educations, in our schools um, and generally in, in work situations 
either. You generally get criticism for what is not done right. And it's very rare that somebody will ask you, how do you think we can make things better? Um, I was wondering, because you are really bringing this, because you say little things, little things. Um, and yes, that may look like that, but in fact, they are huge things. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, it's at least 180 degrees change of, of view on things and changing your ideas and your beliefs about things. But those are all very hard things to change. So I was wondering, how do you go about getting people to to this approach? Because I can imagine you will run into quite a bit of resistance and people say, but I know how to run my business. I know how to do this. And don't you come telling me what to do um, and that kind of stuff. So how do you go about that? You know, it, that's the secondary conversation, Harry, you know, because when somebody streaks, you know, seeks us out to bring us in, it's coming from some place of pain. You know, it's some coming from some place of stress or whatever the, the suffering may be and whatever it's labeled as, it's still fundamentally the same thing that's going on for every human being. So ever before I even touch anything like that, I start, it's just with the employer. It's just having conversations. It's just about finding out where they are at. And sometimes it can be a couple of conversations. Sometimes it might take a little bit longer. But I will say that to them. We'll start the process of the business when, when, when you're clearer, you know, when you're less stressed, when your head isn't full of, because we're always, we're either responding or reacting, Harriet. It's one or the other. We're either going to respond to a situation or we're going to react to a situation. And when we're burnt out, when we're caught up in our heads about how things should be and stuff, we find ourselves in that situation where we're, everything is a, is a reaction to something else. Whereas if we can cool down that first, so everything that's going on in the salon isn't a, or in the business, which was like my case, was a reflection of who I, uh, of who I was. That's correct to a certain point. It was more a reflection of a complete lack of, under, uh, a complete lack of understanding. I'm still the same guy. I was still the same loving character. I still adore, but I was attaching my meaning to it as well. This isn't functioning. So if this is not functioning, I'm not functioning. There's something wrong with me. And so it was about untangling that little ball first. That is, and that's like I say, when the whole personal to professional conversation really started to evolve out of that. And so often when we start, I start to deal with employers, it's quite personal for a while. And let them be heard first. Let, they, let all of that be heard. Let all the stresses and strains and the angst and stuff, because it, there's a lot in it. And once that gets cleared, that, that debris gets cleared back, it's so much easier to elicit that vision then. Yeah, but you're clearly building a very strong relationship with them and building yes. their trust in you. Yes. So right when, when you come up with a suggestion or possibly consider this or that, they will be open to... Mm -hmm. Uh, looking at it. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah, can, I can add a, a few things to that uh, mm. from my own experience with working with uh, business owners. Um, is that, as Billy said, uh, they're seeking out some consulting or coaching to, to, to create a solution to. to but they might see a problem. But the thing with uh, business owners, in my experience, is that they're often very quick thinkers in, and they see, uh, they can reflect uh, in both ways on their own performance, especially if they're, uh, there's, a, there's a difference um, to, to me, and it's very, very generalized. But the business business owner who start their own business, they they tend to be creative thinking. They might might not be that they, they uh, it might not be that they are not stuck sometimes, but they tend to recover and focus on what they can create rather than what they can walk away from. Mm. And other people in coaching not so much business owners coming in often to, to clear up a pain. Um, but uh, but in my, my experience, the, or at least uh, the business owners I work with, is um, they, they have this issue, but they're always looking to create 
something better mm. not not to get away from that issue rather not just to fix that issue but just fixing that issue is just a little step in the whole process oh, yeah. Oh, yeah to me it, it, what i have found back it just what worked for me no, it's it's it, 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 it's generalized uh, in, in that sense, but for me, it it just that uh, I was still holding on to a strong personal identification, a strong personal attachment mm -hmm. to the success of the business being a reflection of who I was. So I will, for me, it, it, it's small businesses can be uh, can be tend to be more isolated than you know the lesser yeah. resources and stuff than big businesses. So so often small businesses have a stronger sense of isolation. They mightn't be attached to an industry per se. Hairdressing was a notorious industry for, you know, for being separated. It's only really in the last number of years, particularly in Ireland, where it's become, it's really just starting to become um, a cohesive unit, a cohesive representation to government, etc. It's taken many, many years for people to, there's been fits and, you know, and starts and stops, but this time it's taken, it has taken root. But it, so in this industry, like when I opened my salon, Bart, I was the only person in my business that spoke to every business owner, every salon owner that was in the town, my competitors. I rang every one of them on a regular basis to say hello and chat to them because I wouldn't let myself get sucked into that conversation about who is and who isn't talking are bitching about each other and small businesses can do that because it's it, quite easily in, in, in the psychology of it because they're more isolated and the resources are less and and and, and so a lot of the time it, it, it's more about kind of holding on to what you have you know and you're and, and it, the irony is it's the letting go that allows it to grow but it, it, it's it's that story, whatever that story is about keeping it tight and keeping it this and keeping it that. And you are right. Business owners are alert. That's why we're in business. We just move to solutions all of the time. But I find in, the, in this instance, like I'm responding to Harriet's question, I have just simply found, okay, if this is to grow, I, I need to know where the boss is here. I need to know where their head is at. I need to know like, how they're seeing things. I need to know... You know, what can I see now and challenge now and preempt now that when we're starting to widen this conversation out, that it, that we have a, a context and a reference point for. Absolutely. And and that's how, it, and to, to me, that's how it works for me. And I, and I work through that understanding to, like we would say, with smaller businesses, because I get the isolation nature of it. So it can be a little bit protective, a little bit touchy, a little, you know, it can, so just to kind of, work my way around that get the client get the, the salon owner get the business it didn't matter I, I know i'm using the salon owner but get the business owner over here mm -hmm. let's have a conversation let's get clear you know uh, you know what are the challenges and just get it get the feel for where they really are at back you know yourself as time goes on relationships open they deepen so other stuff shows up mm -hmm. but i like to I, I like to get the landmines first absolutely it's part of the the coaching uh, conversation mm -hmm. Good stuff. But I think what's what is also very powerful is your your own experience of having gone through this process mm -hmm. and being willing to look at yourself in this. Because I think for a lot of people that is very hard. Um, because we are so used and we are taught to really make a direct line between what we do and our results and our value as a person and who we are, like you say, as a person in this world. Um, and, and that just goes from, from really young. In, in, in education, you very often see that uh, parents are telling their child, You're, you are impolite, or you are lazy, or you are this or that, instead of saying that they have a, just a behavior that they're not very happy with, which is a completely mm -hmm. different thing. Um, but they are talked to in terms of identity and not in terms of behavior. And so if you take that into your business, and so you think if I make a mistake, that means I'm, I'm an idiot, I'm stupid, and I don't yeah. deserve to live, then it's really hard to start looking at that because you start to question your entire foundation. So I think if you can, in those conversations, make space for them and also through your own example, uh, show that it is possible to look at what you've been doing without challenging who you are necessarily. I think that's mm -hmm. also where you can help them deliver, to, to develop the trust to start looking at this because that's the first step. 
I mean, it's one thing yeah. to say we have a problem and we need an answer, but usually the answer that they want is somebody else to change. They should change. This is usually yeah. how it is. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny, you know, I, the graphic that comes to my mind is always when the pyramid of a business. You, you know, if you work your way all the way up to the CEO, he's at the point, he's at the top of the triangle. And, like, and at that stage, it's about that. The, the area that the CEO is always looking down on everything else, but where they are themselves is, is into that little point. The only way that it goes this way and back outwards is by going inwards. It's, about, it, it's into the area of understanding now and into the area of moving just past behavioral modification into a, into a deeper understanding. And it, and it widens out. It's back into that area of creativity uh, that you were saying, Bart, because it, you know, it, it, the CEO is no longer wedged into whatever well, this is it. No, after all of this, I'm here, you know, and this is it. Whereas it's, if you can take them inwards, it opens it back out and, in, and you know yourself, then you go back into an expansive area of creativity again you, you, you're taking them out of that little wedge that the owners the, of businesses find themselves in you know this is the owner's role and this is all and so everything seems so myopic and focused on one thing and so it's just it, it kind of helps to open it out that way and that's I suppose another way of describing what my earlier conversations are is about doing that and kind of just just opening it out to the possibilities of what may show up Very good. Very good. Thanks, Billy, on that. Joe, have you got anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, I mean, have you got any advice for someone who's starting a business from scratch and also what you feel is kind of what makes a difference between a um, business thriving and failing? That's that's a wider question. That's a two-parter, and it's a it's a wider question than than, than, than simple answers, Joe. Um, I think when you're starting any business, you know, it is a need for it anyway to start out with. That there is some element of it of the business that service that's serving you. But I think what happens, Joe, and I think this, especially in creative industries, particularly we tend to set aside the subject of the business and the money and all of these things in in pursuit of the the creative and the pursuit of all of this reward in here as it were but ultimately a business is about sales ultimately a business is about sales ultimately a business is about your income in your except all your expenses, etc., and everything going out on what's left for you as well as part of the profit of the business. And so it must there must be a realistic comeback as part of the business to, for investment and stuff. So around the money, it's not just about the idea, it's not just about the um, the creative nature of just say of hairdressing, cutting hair and coloring it and doing all of those things. There are staff to be done. There is uh, profit and loss. There's a business to be run. So is it profitable? Are we doing the right things? Are we doing this for money? Are we in profit with this? It's not a dirty word. But often that gets lost, even for me included. Like I say, it was only by pure raw enthusiasm that got me going for the first couple of years, simply because I had low expenses and uh, my talent was, was paying for everything. It didn't seem like an issue, but as the business went on, but I was making money right from the very start, Joe. Any business ultimately has to do with sales. So that's a part of the business that really needs to be addressed as much as anything else. Be clear about that. And the more you grow your business, the more you have to invest. But if you're not growing your sales, Joe, and if you're not focused on making sure that that part of the business is is as clear as, as everything else you are, it, ultimately it's, it's just going to go under. You do need money to run a business, you know? And I would say that like, don't shy away from that aspect of it. Get clear on both, uh, on both what it is the service that you deliver, but plus the fact of how does this, how does this add up? How, does, how do we make money in this? So I would say, you know, take, make sure you have both sides of the equation when you start. 
Make sure you boil. You asked me that there was a second part of the question as well, wasn't there? I think it was that, or did I answer that? Or was the? It was just kind of what you think makes a difference between a business succeeding and failing, and I guess. Um, well, I suppose there's there's that in it, you know. There's ultimately yeah. that in it, but. Ultimately, I, I, I would say in the sense of the person that owns the business, Joe. Businesses that thrive, even in the most challenging of, challenging of times, tend to be nimble, tend to be quite cohesive, tend to work well together. And so it's good leadership it is really ultimately what makes the difference. Whereas it's just the, the belief of Billy, I am a believer in servant leadership. I am a believer in empowering my staff all the time. More education, uh, more backup, what do they need, etc. Because the more empowered they are, the less I have to worry about it. But ultimately, it, it, it is it is my division of my business. But the businesses that can remain agile. The businesses that can keep costs down and, and, and that there's, there's a strong cohesive element there. That's not always true. People can drive businesses, you know, dictatorially. Wouldn't be my style. But um, to me, there would be elements, you know, like I said, it's a broader question than just having any one answer for it. But ultimately, businesses that can stay nimble, businesses that have a, a, a clear focus of what they want to deliver, understand the profit and loss of how to keep the business going mm. and keep the team together. And and, when, and from my own personal experience, we'll thrive through the harvest of times, Joe. We'll thrive through the harvest of times. Does that answer? Does that help me? Yeah, yeah, it helps. Yeah, thank you. Billy, fantastic. Yes. Such a great conversation. Really deeply appreciate that, my friend. It was, yeah, wonderful to hear your story and the, and the, the sharing that you've had. Um, I hope it's been helpful. I mean, you know, that, that, that there's something in there for somebody and from Joe and for whoever else gets to watch yeah. this. But maybe we'll bring you back for part two. <laughs> Billy, where can people get hold of you? Well, it, it, it's it's very simple. They can get me a Billy Man Coaching on Facebook or Billy Man Coaching on Instagram. And I'm just a bit lazy about doing LinkedIn, you know, I because I've been happily pottering away for the last number of months. So I'm kind of just widening that back out. But just primarily, you'll get me in both of those places, Facebook yeah. and uh, and Instagram under Billy Man Coaching. Super. Both I'll put that all yeah. in the uh, in the description in the context. Uh, mm. We'll put this out there for everyone to watch and and to listen to and uh, to pass comments on, etc. So, really, from from ourselves and uh, for Joe coming along as well. Really, thank you, Billy. It's been a a wonderful, uh, yeah, wonderful hour of listening to you and your sharing, etc. So. Again, thank you. And My pleasure, Richard, and Bart and Harriet and Joe. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the, having the, the opportunity to talk about it. Beautiful. Thanks, Billy. You take care now. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye.